Well, we're going to continue our trip through Job, week two. All right? Job chapter 23, verses 1 through 9 and 16 through 17. And this is Job's reply. Uh, it's called, My Complaint is Bitter. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find God, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he, con he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would heed me to me. There are there, there an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. However, if I go forward, he is not there, or backward, he is not there. I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint the Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness and the thickness, thick darkness would cover my face. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Lord Christ. <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, we're in our second week of four weeks of probing the book of Job, working our way through this story, doing so by taking a samples from critical spots in this challenging to read book. It has a long it has long been accepted that the book of Job is a composite of writings. Basic prose at the beginning and at the end describes a wealthy man who falls victim to a heavenly action. He refuses to curse God and is ultimately restored to greater fortunes. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The prose tale serves as a prologue and an epilogue to a long poetic section that contains arguments among four humans about divine justice and then divine response. To say the least, it can be a challenging read. Last week, we looked at the overall context and setting of the book. We learned that this is a story to make a theological argument, not a record of historical event. We learn that this story is challenging the orthodoxy set up by the book of Deuteronomy and its simplistic theology of retribution, that you do bad and God will punish in the reverse. Chapters 1 and 2 set the framework for the theological conversation in poetic chapters 3 through 41, really almost all the rest of the book. Chapter 23, we read from today, is a long ways in reading terms from chapters 1 and 2. So a quick summary, just a few highlights so that we can make that leap from chapter 2 to chapter 23. In chapter 3, Job laments his birth. From his perspective, he can lament because someone never born would be would not be experiencing what Job is going through. Job has lost great wealth, family, and health, all but his life. Job laments, Job's lament affirms his despair is total. Only his righteousness, his relationship with God, forbids him from taking his own life. <clears throat> In chapter 4, all the way through chapter 27, Job and his friends have, have it out in rounds of dialogue. Job and his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, give speeches in very long poetic forms. All four characters remain committed to a mechanistic worldview, the view that those who act righteously can expect only good things to happen, and those who fail to act righteously can, exp can expect calamity. They stick to the power of this view to explain for understanding Job's plight. 
each of his friends contends that since Job has experienced calamity, he, or maybe perhaps his family, must be guilty of sin. They contend Job is experiencing God's retribution. Before we're too hard on Job's friends, I think we should ask ourselves, are we like Job's friends at times? When something bad happens to some person or persons, do we at least in our minds say things like, well, they should not have tried to live in that neighborhood anyway. They shouldn't have not have should have known not to drive into those floodwaters. They should have been willing to get the shot. We allow ourselves to go there sometimes. Well, in our text today from chapter 23, Job sets himself apart from his friends and moves in a very different direction. He retains his commitment to the mechanistic cause and effect worldview, but unlike his friends, he is confident of his righteousness. Job does not accept the premise that he has sinned and that his troubles are simply God's punishment. For himself, Job resolves this contradiction in beliefs by challenging the justice of God. God did not get it right, Job says. Furthermore, in his bodacious fashion, Job is again saying if God is not following the dictates of the mechanistic worldview that they all knew and accepted, God must be held to account. I'm standing my ground, says Job. My complaint is legitimate. God has no right to treat me like this. It just isn't fair. I can hear him saying, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. Furthermore, Job envisions placing God on trial in hope of being vindicated himself. Our reading today, you, you can hear the opening lines as Job just like a lawyer practicing his opening statement for the trial. Today, also, my complaint is bitter. Bitter could be translated as rebellious. So he's saying my complaint could be considered rebellious. Job knows he is way out there. But like any good lawyer, he wants to present his case in the strongest possible terms. He continues, his hand is heavy despite my groaning. Job seems to be saying, despite my talking about this, there is a heavy hand here. You, the jury, heard that in his opening remarks. But even with this bitterness and rebelliousness, Job wants nothing more than to present his case before God. He is willing to go wherever. He is willing to even go to God's house. Home or away, it doesn't matter. Just let him have his say to lay out his argument. Yet Job appears to be open to God to learn God's accusations. He says, I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say. He does not expect God to necessarily accept his argument, but he does expect that he would be heard. In summary, Job seems to remain convinced that if he could present his case, he would be acquitted. He is convinced that any upright person like himself could reason with God and be acquitted. The result would be a decision from God that would publicly serve as a rebuke to those friends of his who have been so hard on him. The result could be validation of his own view of justice of God. But Job has a problem. God does not appear to be present. He looks forward. He looks backward. He looks to the right. He looks to the left. He tries going in every direction. Yet God is not to be found. Job is still confident that God is aware of him, aware that the way I take, he knows. Yet if God is so elusive, how can he be he placed God on trial. 
Can you relate to how Job feels about presenting his case to God? If he could just find the right courtroom with God being in session, is this not part of our own human experience at times? Our reading for this week skips verses 16 and 17. Here Job seems to say it, it is clear that God has been the source of my agony, and that terrifies him. Dennis Tucker comments that in the NRSV translation that we use, of the last verse is quiet or not so quiet resignation on the part of Job. In this translation, Job seems to resign to the idea of his only source of relief would be death. And that has a theme that appeared earlier in Job. However, Tucker points out if we skip over to the Na uh, New International Version translation, it provides actually a better reading of the Hebrew text when it says, Job says, yet I am not silenced by the darkness by the thick darkness that covers my face. Rather than a resignation to God's absence and his death, Job concludes the chapter with a voice of resistance. Job refuses to acquiesce to the claims of his friends and refuses to accept the apparent injustice of God. He will not be silenced. And neither will he give up his faith in God. Well, in this text today, has anything actually been resolved? No, not really. Job is not vindicated. God is not justified. Any new or brilliant theological insights to be considered? No, not really. There's just Job's frustration and anxiety, his lament around his desire to plead his case before God without being able to do so. It's a difficult enough for Job to endure the losses he suffered. Now added to that hardship is his growing sense that God is eluding him. I think we in our lives struggle like Job as we search in vain for places where we can deliver our complaint. Job wants nothing more than to deliver his lawsuit against God. As we struggle along with Job, as he searches in vain for that royal courtroom, we could do well to learn from Job's persistence, learn from what his unrelenting conviction that he will have his day in court. Job wants his hearing because even though he feels his complaints are going unheard, he cannot let go of the conviction that God is ultimately just and that God ultimately will hear him. Until that day, Job's questions linger. That is why we speak of the patience of Job. Maybe it should be the persistence and patience of Job. I think too often our response to these frustrations and anxieties of real life is simply to give in to resign ourselves to our misfortune, saying it must have been the Lord's will. I guess we will just have to accept it. This shows up far too often in times of loss and stress. We hear those trite phrases like it must have been God's will. God needed another angel. Not helpful responses. Another unfortunate option is perhaps just abandoning faith in God altogether thinking we can walk away from the church and walk away from God. Just ignore it altogether. Job offers a third way. He is unwilling to accept the suffering passively, unwilling to accept his plight as punishment of God, and he also refuses to abandon his faith. He retains confidence that he can present his case to God. Perhaps we should be reminded that arguing with God is an act of deep faith. Deeper, perhaps, than passive acceptance of whatever happens as God's will or the thin theological rationalizations 
for why things are the way they are. So, where are we in our trip through Job? At the end of this week's reading, we are still on the ash heap with Job, but we have learned from him how to lament. We have learned from him we can bring our anger, pain, grief, and despair directly to God, even when we feel God's absence. We have learned from him how to have hope, even if only a little, holding on to God with a fierce faith, trusting that God is God, trusting that God will hear, trusting that God will answer. If this is not comfortable for you, take heart. We have two more weeks with the book of Job to pursue the more specific answer from God. And that answer will come, not one that Job or necessarily we could ever imagine, but an answer nonetheless. Stay tuned. Amen.